say something you should not. Testing, testing, check, check. Testing, one, two, three. Check, check. Can you hear him? It's good. I'm going to start in just a moment, so. All right, good morning, St. Paul's Church. So good to see you all here. Thank you for, for coming out. And uh, welcome to anybody who's joining us on live stream right now. Uh, glad you're here. So um, I'd like to start with a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who joined us for our membership meeting last week online after service. We had a great turnout, so we really appreciate you, uh, you being there for that. And uh, we wanted to let you know that the two votes did pass, um, so that's all good. So thank you for your participation in that, those who, who were involved. Um, the, other, the other announcement, and this is a, a much more important one, uh, for anyone who did not hear uh, beloved member Chuck Redfern passed away last Sunday afternoon. Uh, he passed away peacefully with his son Caleb and his wife Andrea by his side. Um, and he has gone on to the eternal glory that far surpasses all earthly sorrows. You know, that was what we talked about uh, in the last message, that there is an eternal glory that awaits us who are in Christ, that makes all of the sufferings in this world seem small, or as Paul puts it, that makes them seem light and momentary, which can almost sound insulting when we consider how much suffering uh, people go through, including Chuck. Uh, but it's not insulting, it's actually good news that the suffering is really light and momentary uh, compared to the glory that is coming. So I just, I want to encourage all of us to continue to be in, in prayer for the Redfern family, especially for Andrea and for Caleb. Um, they really appreciate your prayers. 
And they also uh, want you to know that uh, there, uh, there will be a service, but not right away. They're planning on uh, putting it off until things with COVID time uh, calm down a little bit. They're hoping to have family come from out of state and as many people come as, as would want to be there. So they are going to wait on that. Some of you have been, have been asking about that. Um, so we're going to wait for now. Um, but uh, since we, I don't know when a service is going to actually occur, I thought it would be uh, nice for me to share a story about Chuck. Uh, I shared this on Facebook, so some of you might have seen it there. But I started as pastor here about four and a half years ago now. And uh, this is the first time I've ever been a pastor, was he is here. And uh, naturally, when you step into a pastoral role, there's a lot that you don't know. And uh, I remember I, I found out that one of our members was in the hospital. And that was Chuck. And so I thought, well, I'm his pastor technically, so I should uh, go to see him in the hospital. And so Keith and I went, and this was sometime during my first month, at St. Paul's, and I had no idea what you do when you go to see somebody in the hospital. I just felt like, boy, I, you know, I, I feel clueless here. And I got there, and I was meeting Chuck for the first time, and he just right off the bat, he was like, oh, you're just starting. This is the honeymoon period. And he says, well, let me tell you about this, because Chuck had been a pastor uh, all of his working life, and he had a lot of experience. And so... The whole time when I was supposed to, you know, go and minister to this church member, he ministered to me. And I remember I left the hospital that day just feeling so filled up. Um, we talked about a lot of things. We covered a lot of ground. And I just remember coming away from that. Maybe Keith remembers too. I just said to Keith, I was like, I really like that guy. <laughs> um, so... I'm going to miss him very much. I know that um, those of you who, who knew him will as well. Um, but we're relieved that he's no longer suffering, and we celebrate the fact that he is experiencing that eternal glory uh, that far outweighs sufferings. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful late summer morning. We thank you for the cool breeze. Uh, we thank you for the sunshine. And Lord, we just invite you to meet us here this morning. We know that you're already here. We know that you are the author of every good and perfect gift. And we just celebrate your presence with us, Lord. We celebrate your faithfulness to us. And we ask that you would renew us this morning. Lord, we praise you uh, for the life of Chuck Redfern, um, a good and faithful servant. And we pray your blessing upon his family. We pray for peace on Andrea and Caleb. And we thank you for the testimony uh, that you gave us of your goodness through him. We invite you here in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. Special shout out to that fellow in the rocking chair back there. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises Hear the sound of hearts returning to you Return to you In your kingdom Us 
Good morning again. <clears throat> um, qu- a couple things I forgot to announce uh, at the start. If you need to use the bathroom, just go down the, that brick path right there. There's a door. Go through the door. And uh, it's just down the hallway a little bit on your right. Um, I always forget to say that. <laughs> and um, also, uh, the way that we're doing things here, we're, we're trying our best to um, take precautions uh, surrounding the virus um, and also to make people as comfortable as possible so as many people feel safe being here. Um, so what we are asking is if you are not seated on one of your spots to have a mask on. Uh, and if you're singing, we ask you to wear the mask, even if you're on a, on a spot. That's a new thing that we're, we're asking you to do. Uh, we're asking you to do it so that more people feel safe being here, as many people as possible, just because we recognize that uh, singing is uh, something that sprays our respiratory droplets more than just ordinary talking. Uh, it's the same reason why we have things set back a little further in the front, because obviously I'm not wearing a mask, so that's for your protection. So. If we, we just encourage you to, uh, to follow those guidelines. Um, we, uh, I, we haven't uh, been real clear about what the guidelines are, and so if you haven't been following them, don't worry about it. We, there's no shame on you, uh, but we just want to be clear right now, these are the, the guidelines that we're asking you to operate by. So somehow the summer has flown by, right? We are, uh, we're at the end of August. And uh, that means that we are now in the thick of, get ready for it, election season. And that means that a lot of people have a lot of strong feelings right now, right? Uh, People have strong feelings about who should be voted for. People have strong feelings about what issues matter the most. Uh, People have strong feelings that arise from a variety of things, right? People have strong feelings that arise from moral concerns. People have strong feelings that arise from a sense of personal identity, who they see themselves to be. Uh, People have strong feelings that arise from fear. People have strong feelings that arise from a passion for their sense of justice, right? And people have strong feelings that arise from, let's face it, sinful, selfish impulses, right? And often, uh, our feelings during this time arise from a combination of all that stuff, all at once. And in the midst of all these feelings, feelings that we may be carrying, feelings that the people around us are carrying, There are some questions that we have to ask ourselves. They're very important questions. Questions such as, during this time, how am I going to conduct myself so that Jesus is glorified? How am I going to conduct myself so that more people recognize the goodness of God? How am I going to conduct myself so that when election season is over and the dust has settled and the candidate I wanted either is or isn't in the White House, how am I going to conduct myself now so that more people, not less, are interested in knowing Jesus Christ and hearing what church people have to say about him? Those kinds of questions are more fundamental and more important than who should I vote for? Which, by the way, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Okay, that's not my job. Uh, But I do want to help us navigate this emotionally volatile time in a way that glorifies Jesus. So, To help us get started in doing that, I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, to turn to John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1. 
It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And then just move down a little bit to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So this is shortly before Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, he knows that he only has a little bit of time left on earth uh, before he goes to heaven. And so to get an important point across, Jesus does something that shocks his disciples. He washes their feet. Now, of course, we are now 2,000 years removed from this culture. So our culture is very different than theirs. But I think that we can appreciate the significance of what Jesus does here. Because even today, we still think feet are pretty gross, right? Um, I remember a little while ago, somebody shared a picture on my Facebook feed of someone in a subway, and they had their feet up on the seat, their sneakers up on the seat. And they had shared this picture like, oh, look at this, you know, this is disgusting. And lots of people were commenting and saying, yes, yes, that is disgusting. Isn't that gross? Uh, so like in Jesus' day, right, whatever touches the ground, we don't think that should be going where people sit or where people eat or anywhere near our, our hands or our bodies, right? And in Jesus' day, people didn't have closed shoes the way we do, so their feet got a lot dirtier than ours do. Uh, their feet got very dry. Sometimes they got cut up. Uh, they were walking around in areas where they didn't have good sanitation the way we do today. So their feet got really nasty. And so in those days, when you entered a house, a good host would give you a wash basin to wash your feet. And a really good host, a wealthy host, would have a servant who would come and wash your feet for you. But get this, that was considered to be a very, very lowly, humbling job. In fact, so much so that Jewish rabbis at the time used to say, if you have Jewish servants, don't make them do that. That's just, that's too low. If you have a Gentile servant, okay, you can ask them to do that. But if they're Jewish, don't degrade them by making them wash feet. Um, they, they would see washing feet kind of like the way we, we would see scrubbing pu public toilets, you know? Just a very lowly, humbling task, okay? And yet, Jesus does that task. He willingly chooses to wash the disciples' feet. Now, I want us to notice something in verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So... He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now, do you realize how strange that is? It basically says, Jesus knew that he had absolute authority. He knew that he had, no, he had all power. He knew that he was divine, that he was God. So, he washed feet. 
wait, what? <laughs> That's like saying the king had absolute authority, so he scrubbed the public toilets. The second part of that sentence doesn't seem to follow from the first one, right? We expect to hear something like, the king had absolute authority, so he made his servants fan him when he was hot and peel him grapes and bring him snacks and that sort of thing. Or, the king had absolute authority, so he silenced anyone who disagreed with him. Right? That's the kind of thing that we expect to hear. But here we're told, Jesus had absolute authority, so he washed feet. Let that sink in. Jesus sees power as a means to serving other people. Now, we tend to think of power as something that we gain so other people serve us, right? So that we don't uh, have to serve anybody else. But Jesus thinks of power totally differently. For him, power is the choice to humbly serve others. That's what true power is. And that is how Jesus wants us to think about power as well. Uh, this foot washing, he says, is an example of how you should live. This is an example of what you should do with the power that you have. This is an example of how you should understand what true power looks like. It looks like washing feet. It looks like humble service. Jesus tells them, no servant is greater than their master. In other words, if I am your master, you should be doing stuff like this. If I'm your master, you should be humbly serving others. You should be washing feet. You should be getting down into the dirt where nobody else wants to go, looking out for others' interests. You should be willing to lay down your privileges for the sake of other people. Oh, this is, this is tough. <laughs> This is really hard teaching. If we don't, if we don't recognize how tough it is, uh, we, we aren't really hearing what Jesus is saying here. And you know what? It's even tougher when we recognize Jesus washed Judas' feet too. Did you notice that? Judas, the one who would betray him. And, and Jesus knew that Judas was going to turn against him. It says that very clearly in the text. Jesus knew that was coming, and yet what did Jesus do for Judas? He washed his feet. So, remember the questions that I told us we, we need to be thinking about during this election season, right? How am I going to conduct myself so that Jesus is glorified, so that he is accurately represented during this time? How am I going to conduct myself so that more people are drawn to him drawn to the kingdom of God. Well, this passage gives us a place to start, right? We need to conduct ourselves in a way where people look at us, they look at the church, and they think, those are people who are humble. Those are people who value humility. Those are people who care about me. Those are people who aren't just looking to be served, but are willing to serve. Those are people who want not just to protect their own rights, but to protect mine too. But unfortunately, that is not always what happens. Okay? Um, sometimes, people outside the church look at the church and they observe us and they think, these are people who are mostly concerned about their own power and privilege. And they think, these are people who are kind of prideful. These are people who seem more interested in power than principle. These are people who seem to want to impose their beliefs onto me. Now, just to be clear, okay, I'm not trying to point the finger at anyone here. Okay, um, I, uh, I'm, I'm just talking about the church in America throughout the last few decades that I have been observing it. Okay, I grew up in the 
American Evangelical Church. That is my, my tribe, so to speak. Uh, you know, I grew up listening to DC Talk and Jars of Clay and Newsboys and leading a, a Bible study in my public high school. Okay, I've, I've been in this world for a while. And I, I can say with confidence, I know that those on the outside looking in, that is often what they see. Let me give it an example of what this can look like, practically speaking. So recently there was a, a very public case of a large megachurch in California that chose to meet despite violating uh, public health protocol is in the news a lot. I'm not going to say uh, the name of the church, right? but it was very public. And so th there was a gathering of thousands of people, um, no masks, no physical distancing, indoors, big, big church. Now, the people who made that decision, the elders of that church, I believe that their intentions were good. Okay? Um, I read the statement that they put out for why they chose to do it. And I, I really think that they, they wanted to honor God. They wanted to do the right thing. And so I, what I'm saying here, I'm not trying to condemn these people. Okay? But their decision does not communicate to most people who aren't already in the church, we want to wash your feet. It doesn't communicate to most people who are not already in the church, we want to humbly serve you and we care about you. Those on the outside are probably going to see that decision as selfish. Right? They're going to think, these people want to meet and they don't care whether that makes people sick. Right? They don't care if that causes harm to the community. Whether we like it or not, that's the way that a lot of people are going to see that decision. Now, whatever our opinion about coronavirus is, whatever our opinion is about how the church should be um, handling this, we should all be able to agree that that is not the impression that we want to give to those out there. Right? We don't want people thinking that the church is selfish or ignorant or unconcerned about public health. The church is supposed to be God's instrument for revealing Christ to the world. The church is, is supposed to be the body of Christ, right? That's what Paul calls us. We are the body of Christ. So sh people should not be looking at us and thinking, wow, they're selfish. People should be looking at us and seeing a reflection of the God who gave himself on the cross for the sins of the world. The God who washes feet. They should be looking at us and thinking, those are people who care those are people who are willing to wash feet. Those are people who are willing to humbly serve the world around them. So, you know, I would say that at the very least, if that mega church is going to meet, they should be meeting in a way that mitigates risk, right? That, that honors uh, health protocol. Because even though that can be annoying, and it, it can be annoying, to follow those kinds of rules. That annoyance is a price worth paying to communicate to the world that Jesus cares about them. We're supposed to be people who are willing to get down and wash our neighbor's dirty feet. If that's the case, we should be willing to put on a mask. Or we should be willing to adjust the way that we do services. Now, getting back to the subject of election season, I really want to encourage us throughout the coming months to, you know, if you need to, write down verses 13 through 17, where Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. You are not, you are not greater than your master, and I'm your master, and I wash feet, and you will be blessed if you do what I'm doing. I want you to take those verses, write them down somewhere, where you're going to see them, put them on the bathroom mirror, um, put them somewhere where they will help to center you and remind you 
of the attitude Jesus wants you to have, okay? Because if we talk to people about our political views, whatever our views are, we have to do it in a way where people come away confident that we want to wash feet, that we're that, those kind of people, feet-washing people, the kind of people we're willing to serve, the kind of people who don't just care about winning an argument or gaining power for our Christian tribe, right? But the kind of people who really do care about others, even when we disagree. Now, I will be the first to admit that this is extremely hard to do. It's almost impossible. It is hard to be like Jesus. It's hard to humble ourselves. You know, I don't know about you, but election season can bring out the worst in me. I can go from wanting to wash someone's feet to wanting to dump the basin on their head in a, in a matter of seconds. So how do we stay in the right frame of mind? How do we do that? Well, earlier I asked you to skip over a few verses, right? Well, let's look at verse 6. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So Jesus comes over to wash Peter's feet, and Peter objects. Because, right, this is an activity that even Jewish servants are not supposed to do. It's just too lowly. And Jesus is great. Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the rabbi. He should not be doing this. Peter says, no, 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 no. You can't do that. And, of course, Jesus responds, no, you're wrong. Unless you let me do this to you, you have no part with me. Now, that might sound a little bit harsh. But what I want us to recognize right now is those words should be incredibly comforting to us. Because what Jesus is saying to Peter is, if you really want to be my follower, you have to let me serve you. You have to let me minister to you. If we want to be the kind of people who wash feet, we cannot do it on our own strength. We can't do it in our own power. Humbly serving people is exhausting. It will drain you. And it is our nature not to do that. The only way we can do it faithfully is if we allow Jesus to minister to us. And not just once, but daily, regularly. If we don't let him wash us, we have no part with him. Now, what does that look like to let Jesus wash us? Well, here's one way of thinking about it. We all have dirt in our lives. Because we all have sin. We all have ways that we miss the mark. And what Jesus wants us to do is to bring that dirt to him. In all of its ugliness. All the shame, all the embarrassment. He wants us to confess our sins. He wants us to be uh, reflecting enough on ourselves to recognize the ways that we fall short. You know, during election season, we usually think about all the ways that everybody else falls short. Everyone who, you know, is not in our political party or, you know, likes the other candidate or whatever, right? But we have to think about our own dirt. And Jesus wants us to recognize those shortcomings, bring them to him, confess our sins, and as we do that, he, he forgives us. As we do that, he wants us to experience him Washing us, cleansing us from that dirt, that sin. He wants us to hear him declaring that we are clean. And when that dirt starts to accumulate again, he wants us to come back and confess again and experience his forgiveness and his grace all over again. And here's the point that I'm trying to make. If we're going to serve others in the world, if we're going to be people who conduct ourselves in a way that glorifies Jesus, that represents Jesus well, we need to have an ongoing experience of the grace of God. Personally. 
We need to recognize that we are sinners, that we need that grace of God, and that God gives it to us. Because if we lose sight of that, what happens is our souls become more anxious. And they become filled with anger. They, they become rec- restless. Uh, we, we become prone to losing our temper. And we start to look for security in things other than Jesus, like elected officials. And we start putting our hope and our faith in the wrong things. And when we get into that frame of mind, we have a very hard time washing anybody else's feet. Because all we're thinking about, really, is our own. So if we're going to be the kind of people who make it through this election season with grace, if we're going to be the kind of people who encourage people to move toward the church, not away from the church, we have to stay in communion with Jesus. We have to let him wash our feet daily. If we're not praying, we probably shouldn't be talking about politics. Here's another way to think about this. I'll leave you with this analogy. As Christ representatives in the world, we are called to be kind of like Brita filters. You guys know what Brita filters are, right? They filter out all the dirt and the impurities in your water. Dirt goes in, pure water comes out. And uh, we in the church are called to be like that, right? Meaning, when the dirt comes in, the anger the hate, the bitterness, the condemnation. Instead of giving the dirt back, we're supposed to absorb it. We filter it. And then we give out pure water instead. We give out the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Normally what happens in human interactions is that the dirt doesn't get filtered. Right? The dirt just keeps getting passed around. You insult me, I insult you back. You hurt my feelings, I hurt yours. And there's a lot of dirt that goes around during election season. So one of the ways that we wash feet, one of the ways that we serve our neighbors is by being like the Brita water water filter. Right? The dirt comes into us, but it stops with us. We take it in, but what comes out, we purify. When lies are spoken, we respond gently with truth. Right? When pride and arrogance come at us, we respond with kindness and humility. When hate is spoken to us, we respond with love. That's our calling. It is a tough calling, but that's what it looks like to wash feet. But here's what we also need to remember. Sometimes that filter has got to get changed. Because <laughs> if you leave the same filter in long enough, it, it ain't going to purify the water anymore, right? It's not going to work. And what that means is we have to let Jesus change our filter regularly, daily. Which means we've got to let Jesus minister to us. We have to let him wash our feet. We have to take time to go to him and say, Jesus, a lot of dirt is building up in me right now. A lot of anger. A lot of frustration. I'm feeling hateful. I confess that. Make me clean again. Change my filter. Wash my feet. Remind me of your love and your grace all over again. At the end of the passage, verse 17, Jesus says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I love the plain spokenness of that, right? Now that you know that you're supposed to wash feet and that you need to let me wash your feet, you'll be blessed if you do those things. Which implies if you don't do those things, you're going to miss out on blessing. If we don't do those things, if we don't let Jesus wash our feet and we don't wash others' feet, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. We will not be blessed. 
So let's not lose sight of what's most important. Let's pray. Lord, this is such a tough calling uh, that you, you ask us to follow. Uh, Lord, but we recognize it this morning. We recognize that true power is humble service. Even humble service of those that we don't like, that frustrate us, that we disagree with. And God, we acknowledge that we are weak. We need your help. And we come before you as sinners, recognizing that if we're going to wash feet, we need you to wash ours, Lord. God, I pray that during the next few months, uh, we would be like those, that Brita filter, Lord. That we would filter out the anger, the hate, the falsehoods, and give pure water in response. Lord, may we conduct ourselves in a way that draws more people towards your goodness than away. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We bend our knees Oh Spirit, come make us humble We turn our eyes From evil things Oh Lord, we cast down our idols So give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not give our souls to another Give us clean hands Give us pure hearts Let us not give our souls to another our knees Oh Spirit come make us humble We turn our eyes from evil things Oh Lord we cast down our idols So give us clean hands Give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. And God, let us be a generation that seeks, seeks your Now is the point in our service where we continue our worship through the celebration of communion. Uh, if you are new to St. Paul's, uh, just know the communion table here is open to anybody who professes faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, you don't have to be a member here. And if you're not really sure what it means to have faith in Jesus and you want to know more, uh, talk to me after service. I would love to talk to you about that. Uh, in order to keep things uh, safe, uh, we, we have individual communion uh, cups for everyone. 
And uh, if you didn't grab one on the way in and you'd like to receive one, raise your hand right now. Keith can pass one out to you. <clears throat> so, we talked this morning about how <clears throat> we need to let Jesus wash our feet, right? If we're going to be the kind of people who wash feet, we've got to let him wash ours. And when we participate in this sacred ritual, one of the things that we are doing is we are expressing, Jesus, I want you to wash my feet. I recognize that I need your grace. I recognize that I am a sinner. And Lord, I, I want you, uh, I want to receive the grace that you, you offer through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ offered his body and his blood, his life, so that uh, we might experience victory over sin, victory over death, victory over the devil. And when we participate in this sacred ritual, uh, we are recognizing that. And we are celebrating the victory that we have through Jesus over those things. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. And I lean not on my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven And I lean not on my own understanding My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven Nothing I hold on to. Nothing I hold on to. 
I lean not on my own understanding My life is in the hand of the maker of hell Thank you for joining us today, folks. We have one more song to send you out the door, out of the parking lot anyway. <laughs> How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve How precious still that grace appear The hour I first believe My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior has ransomed me Shall soon dissolve like snow The sun forbear to shine But God who called me here below Will be forever mine Will be forever Thank you again so much for joining us this morning. Uh, plan is to be back here uh, again next week and hopefully throughout uh, the coming months as it stays uh, warm enough to still be outside. Um, I'm trying to remember if I had another announcement. Keith, was there something else I was supposed to say? I feel like I'm missing something. But oh well, maybe you'll have to check your email later. But. <laughs> 
Let's say our benediction. While our service has now ended, our worship has not ended. Because our worship never ends. Now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen.